Yep. This evening is the uh, 21st of April 2014 and our speaker this evening is uh, my very good friend Bill Day and uh, Bill Day is an anthropologist and he's going to talk on some of the uh, activities that he's been involved in through that anthropology which is quite vast but I'll leave it up to him to explain all that to you. Um, welcome Bill. Well, thank you. Um, well, we missed one, but this, this uh, is me here, it's sort of the early days of what was to be. Uh, the Nedland City Council was going to use a, what we regard as a public park where we used to have our bonfires and things and uh, were selling it off for residential sites. So I gathered this petition and if you go to the corner of Smythe Road and Corella in Nedlands today, you'll see these beautiful jarrahs and tuits. It's still saved, <laughs> whether I did it or not, but the council asked me to come and speak to them that night after that appeared in the paper. Uh, next one, please. And then I went up to Darwin, that's a long story, but I got there and identified with the Aboriginal people. I met this middle man here, the Bobby's secretary, which Kim Lockwood mentions as the leader of the Larrakia people, still spoke his language, but living in little humpies, totally ignored. And people were surprised that there were any Larrakias left. The Larrakias are the traditional owners of Darwin. So I said, well, then we'll have a march, and about 20 of us got to go <coughs> walk down into the city. Next one. And here I am uh, at their camp uh, under this tree here. This tree we later used as a symbol for the flag because that's where they were camped. Uh, there's Bobby's secretary and Harry, who these were people you might say were plucked out of anonymity. You're just living in Darwin. No one hardly knew who they were except their own people, of course. And they became known throughout Australia as a result of activities. Next. Uh, their camp was just here. This is not with Coconut Grove in Darwin in 1966, but by 1970 it was still much the same as the drive-in cinema. This is the ocean and little beach. So they said, we'll claim this land here where we're camped. And at that time it was pretty vacant. They are agricultural blocks. When the cyclone comes, this is all surge zone. But if you went to, to Darwin today, this is huge apartments right down to the high tide mark except for the camp that's still there. I'll tell you about that next. So we started doing some protests. We walked out and uh, we'll block the morning traffic. And uh, we did that three times. Uh, people in Darwin were just shocked. They said, these, you know, these are just Aboriginal people. What are they they're doing? You know, they couldn't believe it possible. But if you look at the history, uh, they had fought in the 1950s, there was a big Aboriginal strike in Darwin, as there was before in Port Hedden and the Pilbara with Don McLeod. You know that. And uh, so then they had fought for the right for citizenship. So as soon as I talked about protests, they said, yes, we know what you're talking about, because we fought hard for citizenship. They had their own history. And uh, I said, well, let's put up a, this is from the West Australian. We need a flag. There's no Aboriginal flag at that time. And so we went down to the courthouse, courthouse and raised the flag that we had made. I'll show you the flag. Here it is. Um, I designed it. It's red, brown, and red at the other end. And this is the tree where they had their camp. Uh, these men went to the courthouse on a Sunday morning, raised the flag, and said, just as Captain Cook raised the flag and claimed our land, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, my wife sewed that together with the scraps of material. Unfortunately, it's lost, but as you'll see, they have made replicas of, of it since. This is the courthouse where Lindy Chamberlain was tried, various cases. Of course, it's been totally demolished now, and there's nothing there but just a grassy paddock and a huge pile of house there. And that's the flagpole where we raised the flag. These symbols here are supposed to be justice, uh, you can see that person with their head down. To the Aboriginal people who went there daily, he's saying, $5 fine, pay up. And the poor bloke saying, I haven't got any money. Because that's how much they got for public drinking at those days. Right? 
Uh, this is a recent photo um, that I took. This man is very proud to have kept this. This is a copy of the flag, better than the one I made, but he's very proud of it. And that's, that's it today. It's been used in various um, uh, ceremonies and things. Next one. And if you go to the Museum and Art Gallery in Darwin, this is with, as you walk in the door, this is what you'll see. It's a, a description of the flag. It's a great honour that that's there at the entrance. Mentions what we did. Of course, there's a lot of mistakes in it, but uh, the thought is good. The flag was raised outside Darwin Supreme Court in November 1971. There's, there's the statement about Captain Cook. So everyone can read that as they walk in. Next. Uh, this is, we were invited down to Brisbane 1971 to, no, it was 1972, to speak at a conference. This is the land they claim. This is Darwin today. This is the northern suburbs. There are more of them now. This is uh, the inner suburbs. They claim this uh, sacred point of land here, named Emery Point after one of the early seamen that came there, but to them it's a sacred place called Gundal. And as you can see, it's quite a large area. It's a lot of mangroves, there's a tidal creek, and this is uh, the old, the Aboriginal reserve before it used to go here, but it's just there now. So. That was the claim, and we didn't think we had much chance of getting it, but we, and these are some of the people that made the claim, and you can see the flag on the wall of their shed. Um, I think about this time, the, the Aboriginal flag, as you know, it was making an appearance. It's there's some dispute over which flag came first, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there's a man from Queensland called Fred Fogarty who joined the campus and his knowledge, and you can see he's a very strong man, uh, was a great assistance to them. There's, they're mostly related to each other. Yes, yeah, so a rag, ragged little bunch of people but achieved a lot. Next. So we thought we'd better have a newsletter and I've edited this newsletter for 64 editions over 13 years. This is one of the earlier editions. This, uh, the surveyors that first came and claimed Darwin. So we used to print that off on the old cassette notes and distribute around town. And we got a lot of subscribers throughout Australia. And there's another issue uh, where we're calling for a National Aboriginal Day march and for people to stop work. And now the government was getting quite paranoid or frightened of this movement. And as you will see, they started to uh, keep monitor our activities. And of course, uh, many people in Darwin were very hostile towards us. I remember giving out this newsletter in the hotel and the man said, you tell that Bill Day if I see him, I'll kill the so-and-so. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll pass it on. <laughs> All right, next. And we thought, we'll have it, because we asked for treaties. That was back in 1972. And uh, Bill, Billy McMahon, the Prime Minister at the time, said, we cannot have treaties with Aboriginal people because they are British subjects. And so we thought, well, if, we're, if they're British subjects, as you know, remember on the passports, it had, we were all British subjects then. Uh, we will send a petition to Queen Elizabeth II because if we're British subjects, she's the head, well, she's the head. And anyway, it was the British, as far as the Aboriginal people were concerned, that took their land. So we got a thousand signatures, a lot of them are finger thumbprints, and that's the petition. We waited when Princess Margaret came to Darwin, and people rushed forward to give her the petition, but the police stopped them, and it was sworn. So eventually we posted it to uh, the Queen Buckingham Palace. Yes. And this is the, the words on the petition at the head of it. I'm just I'm saying humility, that's my writing. 
I was interviewed in the ABC uh, last year because it was an anniversary and uh, he said, oh, this is very uh, naive and sort of childish. I said, well, a lot of these people couldn't read and write, you know. It's, um, I could put it in legalese, but it wouldn't be coming from them. And as my wife at the time was a Maori, I had studied about the treaties with the Maoris, and so they had the British signed treaties with the Maoris. What about the Aboriginal? Interesting, they used the word refugee, it's quite topical now. But that's how they were, like in their uh, reserves. If you go back a bit further, there was a curfew. They couldn't even go out in the street at night. Next. You're doing a good job, Peter. Uh, to my surprise, the, the petition ended up in the National Archives of Australia in Canberra. The Governor General, the Queen sent it to the Governor General, and he put it in the archives, and it recently came to light they have restored it very, very carefully. They've taken off all the tape and backing that was on it. And this is the actual um, petition. They invited us to come and see it in 2011. Some of us went there and it's laid out there. It's quite, I was very emotional to see it because I hadn't seen it since I sent it off in 1972. And that's one of the Larrakia men he came with us. The, the archives are very proud of it. And uh, last year they took, sent it up to Darwin. But not the actual petition, it's too fragile. This is an exact copy. Uh, you notice it's all torn and that's where the struggle was with the police. And uh, as I said, it's very symbolic that it's torn because it symbolises the struggle. Um, which Aboriginal people have to make themselves heard. Um, there's a thousand signatures and very few of them are still alive. The people in Darwin, the Aboriginal people, are, are very interested to see the names of their families because this has sort of been blocked out of the history books. I can't see it in any history, even of Aboriginal struggle. You don't see it. Next. So as I was saying, the ASIO, the gov government uh, Mr. McMahon sent ASIO on our tails, and this is, I have since got my ASIO files from the, or some of them, from the National Archives, and you can see the heading there, there's, there's 200 odd pages, but it's, uh, I went over to Indonesia for a holiday, and it says, it is advised that William Bartlett Day departed Darwin on per Mapati Nusant Nusantara airline flight remember, for Indonesia and Timor on Tuesday the 5th of March 1974 at 10.30 hours. Day intends to stay in Timor for 21 days. A copy of his outgoing passenger card is attached. Well, that's wrong anyway. I didn't go to Timor. I went to Bali, but uh, the plane at that time used to stop in Timor. I just thought it's fascinating that they had a copy of my outgoing passenger card and so on. That's only one of the things. It's very interesting. They kept very good records. Say that in 1972 I was talking to you about the Aboriginal situation. Well now if I went to the archives I would find perfect minutes of everything I'd said which ASIO had recorded better than I would have recorded. So it's been very useful. Next, <laughs> very useful in putting the history together. Thanks. So Fred Pogarty, he, he didn't believe in all this um, writing and stuff. He, wanted, he was a man of action. And when the surveyors started to come onto the Aboriginal land, he, he had um, overnight made his petrol bombs, Molotov cocktails. I all I told him was, if the surveyors come, ring up the newspaper and they'll come and you can sit in front of the surveyors or something. He rang up the newspaper at the same time he bought the petrol, so the evidence was all there. But he got, for some, I don't know how it came about, but Frank Galbally QC came up to represent him. Originally Fred was going to say, I did it for land rights, but Frank Galbally Galbally persuaded him to say he wasn't even there. It was a mistaken identity. So it certainly diffused the trial beautifully. 
And in Frank Galbally's book, he said, I did a few favours for Gough Whitman, and I thought, well, maybe that was one of them. He diffused that case. But still, Fred was sentenced to six months in Her Majesty's Fanny Bay prison and then 1974. And it was, of course, land rights was the issue, but him saying he wasn't even there, it didn't, wasn't the issue at that time. Next. And we had to, with Whitlam came in, everything changed, you know, because he said there will be land rights and that here are the, your evidence. So we toured the, the army base where I showed you that point of land, sacred place, this people had not been there since, since the war. And there they were showing us, as me, showing us where the uh, sacred areas were. And that dispute is still going on today. Next. So things were moving with Gough Whitlam and uh, Justice Woodward. And we had several other uh, claims as well. It was looking good at last. Next. So they did. They won the town leases. Um, it wasn't until 19, 1979 when the Northern Territory government got the Northern Territory got self-government. I should have mentioned, of course, what came in Christmas Day, 1974, when I was in Darwin. The cyclone Tracy came down and uh, obliterated the city. Now, to Aboriginal people, that was a supernatural event. It certainly seemed like it. Uh, you know, this, you won't give us our land, and we've been singing this song, and this is what happens. And uh, Fred Fogarty, who was in jail, well, Fanny Bay jail was also flattened, and he was released. So it'd make a good film, I think. Next. And so years later, I wrote a book about it, and it's that here, a copy that there's none left to sell. There's only a few available. And this is the people who designed the cover, included all the land that we had claimed nicely it was along the bank of this creek. And the judge who heard their claim said it should go out past the mangroves, which is quite unusual because usually it's the high tide mark or somewhere. And this is the Aboriginal reserve. This was the land, the tomb. Was, that's the old half-caste home, they called it, the stolen children. And this is the reserve. This is the suburb of Lud Miller who I've had a lot to do with recently, for reasons which I'll explain. Yes. Yes, so we, they got the land. That was granted to them in, in uh, August 1979. And uh, at last they could look after the burial grounds, which were, there was over 200 burials in that land because it used to be an Aboriginal reserve. And in those days, people just went off and buried their people wherever they liked, or within limits, that I have a witness account of a tree burial right, right there in Darwin, near this place. Of course, all the, they don't really put tombstones or anything, so there the were wooden poles of the white ants ate them. I put that sign there to mark it. Yeah, so we had the sacred sites. We could look after them. And during my field work, and this is my camp, uh, they had ceremonies. This is a sand sculpture. Um, this was going to be for fire, and this is water. It's a ceremony of mourning where you wash the people with water and smoke them all over. And this is, has some totemic significance. I think it's the northwest wind or something, depending on the totem of the deceased. But that was fascinating, right in Darwin on vacant land world now Aboriginal land, a lease, uh, a, a rental of 10 cents a year was granted. Yes. And one of the ceremonies was, which I witnessed was to put up the flagpole in memory of the man, who, the man you saw in that DVD with the leprosy. Uh, there's his family and they've got the white paint. It comes from the Macassans. The Macassans used to trade northeast Arnhem Land uh, on their prows for tree pang. The Aboriginal people would gather the tree pang, and they, a lot of the words like rupia for money are come from Indonesia. But balanda for white man is uh, from the Dutch um, 
Hollander, I believe. So they still use these words and many others, Macassan words. And this man here actually has a Macassan chant, which he sang. The raise and they put the flag up and chant. To them, it's an Aboriginal ceremony, but it is a copy of when the Macassans, when it was time to leave on the prevailing wind, they would put up the sail at the mast of their ships and sing their songs. And the Aboriginal people, they all just must be supporting some flags on top of black holes. So it's become an Aboriginal ceremony in northeast Arnhem Land, all from the, the Macassan days. And a lot of people don't realise where it comes from. Next. So out on the land we have the creek and people go fishing and uh, swimming. Well, I'm not sure if you can swim now because crocodiles are moving into town, but he's using the cast net. And the kids, it's a great place for kids and they can a healthy lifestyle. And as that lady said in that, um, on the DVD, now that we live in town, as a lot of people do, we still need a place where we can go and teach our kids about bushcraft and even ceremonies and just to sit down in the shade, get away from maybe troubles at home. That was, that was the dream, but this is the actuality. What happened? This is the land. The people who held the lease changed their constitution so that only a minimum of five members and a whole lot of restrictions on who could become members. So one of the things they did was to build aquaculture ponds on the salt pans where people used to gather shellfish and the migratory birds roosted. So this was going to be a wonderful prawn farm. This is right in Darwin. As you come into the international airport, you fly over there. It's abandoned because it was total failure. So they tried again, turned into a crab farm. More hundreds of thousands poured into it. Again, a total failure. Lots of politicians involved, and uh, no one's paid the price. It's supposed to restore the land under the, the permit, but they haven't. This is monsoon forest. In the wet season, it's full of you know, it's, uh, even yams. And, it's the biggest forest in Darwin and lots of um, wildlife as well. Yeah. The other thing that happened, uh, they've given it out, this is sort of negative, but these are not majority Aboriginal people, this is, uh, you might say, a corrupt group. Uh, they have fenced off an area and allowed a big construction company to use it for a stockpiling of building rubble from building sites where they excavate basements and so on. But uh, a lot of residents of the suburbs are joining, uh, worried about it, and so they should be. It's been going since 2006. Next. And this is what, you can't go in there, not supposed to go in there, but I do, and a friend, and this is what's around the back, pouring out concrete and all kinds of stuff onto the Aboriginal land and someone's getting paid to let them do it. Next one. It gets plenty of publicity. It has, 2010. This tells the whole story. This journalist, Barry Doyle, is not there anymore. But he's told it and nothing's done. Next. Until Bill arrives on the back on the scene. I went into that dump and found this broken pipe. Took a sample, brought it back to Perth. A year later, I thought, I'll, I'll get this tested. And sure enough, it contained asbestos. So I thought, this is the trunk car. So this year, I went back to Darwin and said, this dump has asbestos. And we don't know what else. And I knew that. That's the magic word, asbestos, because it, of course it can be fatal. And there's kids playing on there as well. I asked them, what are you doing here? They said, my auntie owns this land. My auntie Helen, and I knew exactly who he's talking about, the uh, leader of this group that's doing these things. All right. 
Well, this is the big one. That lovely creek. They've signed a caveat for developers. This Arapura Harbour. To dig up the creek. Well, I, I lived there for six years up here, so I know this land pretty well. And uh, fortunately, that's the, one of the best things they could have done because that got all the residents on our side starting to take an interest. And that took years of campaigning. That's 2009. It came out in April Fool's Day, and everyone thought it was a joke, but it's serious. So they signed a, they signed a caveat. They're getting paid for this company. and still hoping to do it, but we got it stopped. Next. Yes, there's the residents coming in, and they've been very good. They paid my fares to go back to Darwin with that asbestos because uh, they don't like to oppose the Aboriginal people because they appear to be racist. But if I'm on their side, you know, they can do that. I can do that side of it anyway. We spent oh, God knows how many hours doing submissions and so on. Nick. Oh, this is another the new another one, the other side of the road. This is the dump. These are the residents of Latin Miller. This is going to be an industrial estate and so is that. With sheds and everything. At the moment this is a drive into town with bush on each side and our dream was as I showed you different activities, those people who fought and died for the land, I call them the martyrs. If they could see it, they'd turn their graves. But uh, that has been rezoned for light industry. It's 39.5 uh, hectares. Well, the residents are very upset about it. They've held meetings. They held a meeting on the verge, and the mob who hold the lease came down and literally had attacked them with sticks and that's all on YouTube very nasty didn't hit them but uh, abusing and intimidating them uh, and that's what goes on and the real estate guys were with them as well and still nothing done well I, we know that developers pay political parties so one favour serves another. Next. And uh, this is what it's going to look like. I've, I've taken this from the developers' plans when they sought permission. This is going to be all down the road. Signs like this. And this is right under the flight path of the airport. Too. Next. Uh, this one upsets me. This has been rezoned. For the second time, the first time we won, and then they bring it back again. This is the entrance into the land, and it's very important, I think, to have a proper entrance. Now, if that becomes like this, there'll be a little pathway between the sheds. So I know the residents of that suburb probably won't support this because it's far away from where they live, and unfortunately, people only get active when it's going to affect them in a lot of cases. And so I suppose I'm an exception that way. But uh, we're struggling to get support for stopping this one. Thanks. And here are the signatures of the people who should be ashamed of themselves, a the woman and her daughter. Bobby's secretary, I showed you, that's his she is, he is her great uncle. So that's the way it's gone. But they're not very popular, but people are a bit afraid of them. Now, that I could show you quite a lot of documents with their signatures on, with a caveat and so on. Next. Now, there's one other place um, we won, or several other places, but it's called One Mile Dam. It's the old railway dam. We've built this, um, excavated this railway in the 1800s for the old steam trains. Well, we put a claim on that too. It follows the same sort of history. And there's a community living there today. And the only difference is these people are strong. They were given the land, and so was the other areas, to provide a permanent place for Aboriginal people to stay when they come to Darwin. 
I don't know what they meant by permanent. Well, it's under threat. Uh, yes, it um, was surrounded by oil tanks at the time. No one wanted it. Same with that other land was swampy and in the flight path, no one wanted it. Now Darwin's grown so much that all land is desirable for developers and developers have money. Well, these people are saying, we're not moving, even though the oil tanks have gone and the luxury apartments are creeping closer and closer, as you'll see. David Timber is on dialysis three times a week, so he's still standing strong there. Plenty of YouTube videos about that. Next. And here's the camp. This is the other camp I'm talking about, One Mile Dam. The dam is in here. Now that used to be oil tanks. And, uh, you know, it's an industrial area. Now it is apartments. The same on this side all around. So they'll be just isolated there. And the plan is so that it's going to be a public park for the residents to walk their dogs. Next. And this is a view from David Kimmel's place. You can see how close it's getting. And uh, that's um, the Evolution Tower, the Red Apartments, overlooking their camp now. And of course, when there was an article written back in the 70s that said, the white man giveth and the white man taketh away. It comes from Job. But, um, well, it's paraphrasing. But um, that's how Aboriginal people probably feel. You just said, we're well, giving us a permanent place and now you're telling us we've got to go. Thank you. And as old Bill never gives up, this is me painting the sign. The residents, their school teachers and people like that, they don't want to be seen walking up and down the sign, so I just walk up and down during the peak when the cars are coming into town. This is a reference to, well, Jake is the company that wants to build the sheds. They're from East Timor, Chinese family. Uh, pig man, because there's a legend that this man half and everyone's, I remember, you tell the kids, look out, pig man, I'll get you, and they run screaming. Well, I was trying a bit of uh, psychology there, <laughs> getting a bit obsessive. And uh, I probably missed out quite a lot, but I skipped through it. I thought with 46 slides it might take a long, long time. But you were nearly going to arrive, so that's good, good timing. <laughs>